Hey guys, this is uh, Omar. I'm the owner of OC Flight Lessons. Um, I recently did a how to pre-flight a Cessna 172 video on our um, story on our Instagram page. And I got quite a few requests from people to upload it to our YouTube page so they can go back and um, watch it over and over again. So uh, that's what I'm out here doing today. I'm gonna do another pre-flight, an extensive pre-flight. Um, I chose uh, the R model that we have. It's a 2003 172R model fuel injected. Um, this one's got the 160 horsepower engine. Some of these come with the 180 horsepower engines. Um, but uh, yeah, so let's get started. First thing I do when I come to the airplane is I check for fuel. Um, reason why I do it first is because if you need to fuel up, uh, you don't wanna wait uh, for 30 minutes to an hour for the fuel truck to get here. So if you check and you need fuel, you can call the, the fueler and say, hey, can you head over here? And if they take half hour, or uh, 45 minutes, it's not that big of a deal because you're gonna be spending time pre-flighting the aircraft anyways. You don't wanna get to the end of the pre-flight um, and then realize you don't have gas and you call them and they say, oh, there's you know five people ahead of you, it's gonna be another hour wait. If you're trying to go somewhere, um, you're gonna be late. So I just checked, I made sure we had gas. Now normally, I always stick my finger in there um, and I feel and I touch the fuel. That's very common, you'll hear among pilots. Um, I've been a flight instructor since 2002, so coming up on 20 years. I've got about 20,000 hours of flight time and 6,000 of that's dual given. I always, always, always tell my students, you gotta touch the gas. You gotta open this thing up and look at it and touch it because these Cessnas are notorious for having faulty uh, fuel gauges. And you don't wanna get you know, halfway to your destination or wherever you're doing and have those gauges fail on you and then play this guessing game, well, how much fuel do I have? Um, you know, am I gonna run out? That's that's not an option. So if, if one of those gauges goes bad and your tanks were full when you left, well, you know, the standard Cessna has 50, uh, excuse me, 40 gallon tanks, depending on which model it is. It burns about eight gallons an hour. So you know you got about five hours of fuel. If that gauge goes bad, you're not gonna panic, it's not that big of a deal. So after I do that, I just take a general overview of the aircraft. If anything were to stand out, that's really obvious. Um, sometimes we have fuel trucks that um, will try to cut in between airplanes. Like if one, this one's missing, uh, he'll try to cut across. I've seen aircraft get sideswiped by these uh, trucks. Um, Oftentimes you show up and there's damage and you gotta figure out what happened and who did it. Um, but anyways, after I, ch I check the fuel, um, I come into the airplane, open it up, and the first thing I'm gonna do is go for the gust lock. Um, you wanna apply back pressure to this yoke as you're releasing the gust lock um, so that you don't damage it. So as I grab it from my right hand, apply back pressure, take the tension off that gust lock I take it and I put it here in the pouch second thing I do is turn on the master switch that gets the battery connected to the um, electrical system I grab the flaps and bring them down now as I bring them down I'm looking at that indicator coming down and I'm looking at the flaps extended next go straight to off you don't want to kill that battery um, now I realize that the POH says something different versus uh, what I just did. You'll start to get, um, you know, better and better at these pre-flights. You'll get more comfortable with them as you start to fly more and more. One thing that I've learned over time is there's a difference between what the POH says and, and the real world. And what I mean by that is if you run that battery and you come out here and you start flipping lights on and you're out here for 10 minutes and you're just fooling around looking at that light and that light, you're draining that battery. The sole purpose of that battery when you start the airplane is to provide electricity to that starter right there. So if you're out here for 10 minutes running those electrical systems, uh, you're draining that battery. We got a jet taken off, so I'm gonna stop for here for a second. typical 
of John Wayne, we get one one of these every uh, minute or so. Pretty busy airport. We're at Class Charlie Airport. Anyways, back to what I was saying. If you run that battery via that switch and you run all these lights and you you drain that battery and then you pull the plane out to go start it, well, you've only got about two or three start attempts before the battery dies. Now, if you're at your home airport, okay, well, you just put the plane back and get back in your car and you go home. If you're at a, a, a different airport, let's say you're on a cross country, well, now you've just stranded yourself at this airport. How are you gonna get home? Uh, if it's a weekend, I guarantee you, you're not gonna find a, a um, repair station or someone to come fix it and you're stuck there overnight. Well, now you gotta get a hotel. Now you gotta get an Uber. Now you gotta spend all this money and be like, oh, well, I didn't know. So yes, I know the POH says that you're supposed to do all this other stuff, but after 20 years of flight instructing and 20,000 hours, I just, you know, I've, I've seen it happen too many times with students and people, and I just don't do it anymore. So after you get the flaps down, um, grab the fuel strainer here. You're gonna start your pre-flight right back here. So you're gonna take a general overall uh, view of the airframe. You're looking for dents, dings, um, pop rivets, things like that. Now the book says to open this, this cargo door. Um, at my flight school, I, I tell the instructors, look, teach the student how to open it and that's it, you're done. The reason is because we fly typically about three flights a day per aircraft. Um, and if you're opening and closing this door, you know, three, four, five times a day, that door is going to break. That latch is going to break. And so rather than have that door break in flight and then you panic and say, oh, the door opened, let's go back. Just don't open it. Open it once, figure out how to use it. And then after that on these pre-flights, just make sure that thing's closed. I've had it happen so many times, guys. Um, so I always leave this closed. I don't, you know, we just had a student come back from a solo cross country, door was unlatched. Um, so I leave it closed and um, yeah, that's just kind of how I do it. Going back here, checking the leading edge here. So why am I looking at the leading edge? That tire right there is the reason why. So as you take off and you pick up speed, that tire kicks up rocks and where do you think it hits? It hits this area here, it's this leading edge area. So if you have damage, this is most likely where it's going to occur. It's not gonna occur on the surface. Um, checking the plastic fairings here. This is looking good. Um, now we took the gust lock out, so we've got some free play in this uh, elevator. We're checking here, this is a ground wire. We've got our um, bolt and our nut right here. Now this one does not have a hole for a, a cotter pin. Some of them do, some of them don't. This one doesn't. Um, we're looking for free play movement. Over here, we're looking at the cables, making sure that the safety wire is on that cable, making sure there's no fraying going on, um, there's no damage. Typically in flight schools, some of the students will have tail strikes. They'll come in, um, they won't carry enough airspeed into the approach, and they go to flare, and the airplane just bottoms out, and they just pull back, and, and this uh, tail section is what strikes the ground. So what I did was I spent some cash, and I installed um, tail skids on every single one of my airplanes to protect my fleet. Critical, critical thing to have if you're at a flight school. Um, the rudder, so <clears throat> taking an overview of the rudder. You never want to grab the rudder from, from this spot here. You always want to grab it from down here where it's reinforced. This bolt, and I've taken a rudder off, this bolt, I got a jet coming by. This bolt is all that's really holding on this entire rudder. So, I mean, I remember I think about eight, nine years ago before I owned a flight school and I was helping one of my mentors um, repair his rudder and take it off. I was like, wow, that's all that holds that rudder on? He's like, yeah, that's it. So if you're ever gonna check something, check that bolt. Make sure that's on securely. Um, that's what's holding on your rudder. 
Um, we got a lot going on back here on the rudder. So that top light, that's your beacon. You want to definitely check the beacons working. That antenna right there that's in the shape of a V is your VOR antenna. There's your nav light up here. We got our student showing up with the instructor Lewis. I'm going to finish up here pretty quick. You guys can start your free flight. These are static wick uh, disperse, uh, electrical disbursement static wicks. So the deal with these is that if you have them installed, they have to be on there. You can't fly with them off technically. If they're not installed from the factory, um, they don't have to uh, be there. That's the rule with that. Um, we want to unhook our tail chain right there. Now I'm going to leave it on for our students that just showed up. Coming over to this side, um, checking for, uh, again, obviously damage, uh, looking for um, any signs of um, wrinkling in the airframe. That's, that's an indication that the airframe has been overstressed. That's bad, obviously. We have limits on these airplanes. Um, the POH shows, you know, you can add positive G up to, depending on what kind of 172 it is. So depending on what kind of 172 it is, determines how much G load factor you can apply to the airplane. Um, it's just like a Coke can. If, if you take a Coke can and you twist it on one end and twist it the other way on the other, it's the same thing with this airframe. Um, you're gonna see signs of wrinkling. That's what's happened to the airplane. So we don't see any signs of that. You can kind of look along the side and be able to tell that's, that's, that's a good thing. Um, trim tab. So this uh, is your trim tab. You shouldn't grab this elevator by the trim tab. Um, you always wanna grab it here. This is, this is a delicate surface. There's your bolt. There's your castle nut. Try to zoom in on that. Castle nut. And there's your safety cotter pin right there. That that has to be on there. That's on all 172s. Um, so when that looks good, coming over here, checking out the plastic fairing on this side. Looks good. Leading edge. These are inspection panels. So we take these off every um, hundred hours and we loop the airframe. Uh, we loop cables, pulleys, and joints, and uh, we use LPS for that. Uh, we lo we're looking inside the airframe for any damage, we're looking for corrosion, things like that. Um, as a pilot, you're not opening up these panels, this is mostly uh, a maintenance function. Coming back here, um, taking a general overview, overlook of the back over here to see if anything stands out to you. Um, ELT antenna, very important. Emergency locating transmitter has to be checked every 12 months um, and recertified. Now they usually do that during the annual inspection. So you'll want to take a look at the logbooks of the aircraft and see that that's been complied with. There's a battery to this. That battery is independent of the inspection. That battery is independent of the inspection. That battery has to get replaced once every 24 months is one condition. If you test the battery, um, more than one hour cumulative use of that battery requires it to be replaced or half its useful life. Now, there's always been that debate, well, what's half its useful life? I don't know. I've never seen it in a book in the 20 years I've been flying, so good luck with that. Coming over here, these are our comm antennas, communication antennas. Notice they're on the top of the airplane, not on the bottom of the airplane. If this plane's on a taxiway and you're trying to call the tower, you're trying to get through to um, um, flight watch or flight service or weather, you don't want those antennas on the bottom um, being blocked by the signal of being on the bottom. So those want to you want to have those on top so that the signal clearly gets across to the antenna that you're trying to transmit to. Other stuff up there is uh, GPS uh, pods. Um, I'm looking at the flaps. So we want to get 
check and make sure there's free movement of these flaps. Now, these flaps sit on rollers. So there's the roller, I don't know if you can see that. Those rollers need to be greased every 100 hours. And as the grease tends to starts to wear out, because as you're flying through the sky, that, that grease is just gonna slowly evaporate or come off. When you extend these flaps, you'll start to see them vibrate. That's not good. Now, if it vibrates a little bit, you're fine. You can go fly. But if it really starts to vibrate a lot, you should start to bring that to the attention of the owner or yourself or your mechanic. Um, back to uh, the flap. If this thing's not being lubed up and under the rare circumstance that it decides not to work, you don't want to have one flap coming down and one flap staying up. You'll have an asymmetrical um, issue with aerodynamics and, and there you go, you'll go off into a spin and, and you'll never recover from that. Um, that was notorious back when I used to fly Brasilia turbo prop back in the day. That was one of our scenarios that we faced in the simulator. You extend your flaps, one side comes down, one side doesn't, and that thing was almost non-controllable. I mean, we would crash every single time in that scenario. Um, once I do this, I check the fuel. So we've got one, what I do is that. We've got two, we've got three, we've got four, and we've got five right there. I'm just gonna simulate that. So I'm going to kind of walk away from them, give them some privacy. What you want to do with this fuel is um, you're looking for water. Water is heavier than fuel, so water is going to be at the bottom. It's going to look like air bubbles, but it's actually water. Um, you're also looking for dirt, rocks, any kind of that crap. You don't want that going into the engine, obviously. Now some people take individual samples of each one. Um, I just hold just get a little bit of each and then if you find something wrong then go back in there and say okay let's find out which one it is what's going on if you find water in there just keep draining it because water is heavier until there's no more water coming out and you're good to go these Cessnas are notorious it doesn't matter if they're new or old if it rains you're going to get water in those tanks and that's why they designed the drains to get the water out um coming over here checking the ailerons so we've got uh, your aileron hinge pin this was this is what holds the aileron onto the aircraft you're checking those four bolts uh, you're checking the hinge pin making sure it's on securely you've got one over here checking for free play on that that's the push rod that's what pushes your um, your elevator uh, excuse me your aileron up or down so that's the push rod and then you've got your counterweight right here you want to make sure that counterweight's on uh the ground ground wire right there now not all the airplanes have the ground wires again if it's not installed um you're not required to have one it's all about whether or not the aircraft had it installed at the factory and was certified like that coming out um, more static wicks right here so wing tip checking the plastic fairing uh looking for damage leading edge that's good you got a little nick there if they're usually below the size of a quarter it's a non-issue um, a lot of bugs on these things pretty typical we'd have a tie down hook here we unchain these are inspection panels for maintenance again not really a pilot function just want to make sure that they're securely closed air vents so we've got air vent for the front uh, this one we've got air vent for the back passengers want to make sure um, there's nothing in there a lot of times bees get in there uh, we get up and check the fuel up there so the way i get up is i put one foot there left foot there right hand here and i get up don't put your foot on the cowling it'll damage you this cowling is a ten thousand dollar cowling just for the the um, to replace this part um now you won't find it in any books anywhere but 
I've been told that the limitation, weight limitation on this is about 225 pounds. That's what I've been told. Um, have I seen guys heavier than 225 get up on it? Yeah, um, and it, it didn't break, but you know, there's limits to everything. So just FYI, I have guys calling all the time saying, hey, I'm 250, 275. You wanna start to be cognizant as you approach those numbers on your weight, because um, the aircraft does have limits to, you know, the size of what you can uh, fly with. Coming over here, we're checking oil. Now, um, I was, you know, even when I, before I was a flight school owner, I was an instructor flying somebody else's airplane. I always treated the airplane as if I was the owner. I always cared about it. So when I checked the oil, number one, I'm not leaking oil all down onto this cowling. And uh, when I check it and I pull it out, you don't need to pull the stick all the way out to check it. You can kind of hold it in its place and rotate it. And that way you're avoiding spilling oil all over the airframe. When you tighten this, you want to go snug, not, um, not too tight on that. The reason why you don't want to go too tight on that is because as the engine warms up and heats up, that metal expands. And once it expands, that um, dipstick will basically freeze to the, um, the pipe that it's supposed to hold. You'll never get it off. Um, you'll have to get pliers. Once you get the pliers and pry it off, well, what you've done is as that, that pipe that goes down into the engine, it connects to the engine and there's safety wire holding it. As you rotate it with a plier, that comes loose. Um, that comes loose and you start to leak oil. Um, and that's one of the reasons why. Um, coming down here, checking the exhaust, making sure that looks good, checking the nose gear, um, looking for inflation, tread, um, looking for any hydraulic fluid leaking out of there. I did miss the tire over here, so I'm going to come back over to it, looking for tread, looking for inflation, looking for bald spots, don't see any of it. Um, brakes, so this is your rotor, um, there's your brake pad, and uh, we've got plenty of brake pad left. This is the brake line where hydraulic fluid comes in. This is the um, the drain. So this is where we put hydraulic fluid in the system. Um, you want to make sure there's no uh, hydraulic fluid. It's um, 5606 is the type of hydraulic fluid we use. It's a pinkish color. Um, want to make sure that's not leaking anywhere. Okay. Back over here. Um, so front of the airplane this is you know, a lot of stuff going on here we're looking at the nose gear again making sure that you've got at least um you want to have around three to four fingers of space in here i've got four um we had an airplane the other day it was down to one i didn't let it fly because it needs to have air in that nose gear so that the um the, the struts protected you don't have metal on metal contact and it's not slamming against uh, the top and the bottom and what causes that is um, I'm gonna come over here transition to this plane give it some more privacy so the way that that this strut is designed is it's got seals in it at the top and it's got rubber round seals in fact I can show you what the seals look like to help you understand this better. And if, that's the thing with this, if you understand what's going on, it helps tremendously to um, keep people from doing it. So, now these aren't the, the, the seals that go in the nose, but they're designed the same way and that's the intent. The, the actual seals are back in my maintenance area. This is kind of what the seal looks like. You see how this is round? Now this, is what goes on top of that strut. You can't see it. You'd have to pull the cowling off to see it and pull the strut apart. That seal holds nitrogen and hydraulic fluid in there. And as you bounce and have these landings and you're, you hit hard on this nose gear, the roundness of that rubber seal gets flattened out and it can no longer hold the nitrogen in there. And so you start to get, in, get it bottom out. And that's why I'm so critical as a flight instructor of, of students when I tell them, hey, when you're taxing, you got to hold that yoke back. 
you got to hold that yoke back, get that elevator back, relieve back pressure on that nose gear. Because if you're taxing fast and you're you're just, it's like a hammer coming down on that seal. And eventually, you pancake it out, that goes down. Now we have seals that go bad in these things about once every two or three months. Not typical of a flight school. Um, I guarantee you though, as an owner, if I was not on the flight instructors to be on the students about that, you'd have these things going out every three weeks or four weeks or so. Um, propeller, 74, 75 inches in diameter. Checking the leading edge for nicks, cracks, damage. On this side over here, looks good to me. Checking the spinner, making sure there's no cracks. Never push on the spinner. Um, if you need to push an airplane, get a tow bar. If you need to pull an airplane and you don't have a tow bar, use the, the hub of the, of the prop. Never pull from the outside. Uh, never push on this. You'll damage this. This is hollow. Um, this is, it's critical not to mess with this right here. Um, alternator, 60 amp alternator. Uh, this is what powers all the electrical system, your, your avionics, radios, uh, your VORs, your nav lights, all that kind of stuff. So you want to check this belt, making sure the belt looks good and it's not cracked or frayed or anything like that. Um, coming over to this side, we're looking at the starter. Starter looks good. Now here's an opportunity to understand systems. This is the ring gear. This is what, you know, it's connected to the prop. So as you turn on the battery and you hit the uh, start button on the ignition, it sends electricity to this starter, which sends teeth out and grabs these teeth and that's what turns the propeller. Now, if you don't let go of that key after start and you keep that engaged, you're grinding that, that ring gear, a lot of people call it a flywheel, um, that and that piece of metal grind out and you get metal falling down onto the ground and you're done. That starter's done. These starters are 700 bucks and they're expensive to replace. That's not including labor. It takes days to get it, the aircraft's down. So you gotta be taught by a professional flight instructor how to properly start the airplane or you could cause a lot of damage to this airplane. Um, checking lights. Obviously we wanna check if it's a night flight. Uh, making sure those work. Um, air filter induction box, that's where the um, where the air, the engine gets its air, making sure there's nothing blocking it. And then checking uh, tread and inflation on, on the tires there. Coming over here, we're looking at the uh, static port, making sure there's nothing blocking that little pinhole. Um, checking the fuel again. I won't check it since it's the same as the other side. Got a little inlet here for cooling of the avionics. Pedo tube, making sure that's clear. Um, stall warning indicator, making sure there's nothing in there, no bees. Fuel vent. So if you see fuel leaking out of here, don't panic. That's what it's supposed to do. That's its job. Yeah, stop list coming. Um, people see fuel leaking out go, oh my God, there's fuel leaking out. Yeah, it's a vent. It, that's what it's there for. As temperature rises, volume expands and that fuel, that vent's there to, to push out the, um, the fuel be, so you don't, uh, um, so you don't uh, damage the fuel tank from fuel expanding too much. Uh, continuing down the leading edge, this is our ADSB out for the wingtip. We don't want to mess with it. You're essentially going to do the same thing on this side with the aileron. I'll skip it because I just showed it to you. Inspection panels, again, um, maintenance function. We don't do it. Now, the flap would be down on that airplane I was doing it on. This one's up, but you're checking for the same thing. Um, this is a light. It, at night, you could turn the light on and check out your tire if you wanted to. I turn them off at night. Um, and then another fuel drain here on this one. This one's got, no, it's a November model, it's older, so it's only got one drain. That plane has five per wing. Um, yeah. Anyways, folks, that's it. I'm going to start posting up some more videos. Um, been getting some requests for it. Just haven't had time. Being a flight school owner is tough. Uh, time is limited. So anyways, hope you guys enjoy the video.